Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. My name is Manuel and today we'll continue discussing the integration of my first CubeSat prototype. And as always, this video is sponsored by PCBWay. Interconnect misalignment. So I'm using these uh, PCBs with M.2 Edge connectors as interconnects between the boards. Now up until a few weeks before the test flight, I never had boards with connectors on both sides, so I couldn't really verify if this really worked. And I was a bit stumped to find out that it doesn't, and then it took me a good long while to realize why that is. I think it's best to take a look at the drawing of the connectors I'm using. So let's screenshot this drawing and bring it into Photopea. Then we are going to clean up these annotations. Now imagine we stack a second board on top of this. The matching connector would be oriented like this, so basically just flipped vertically. Let's now tint the bottom one blue and the top one red and set the blending mode to multiply. And what we see is that the contacts actually overlap. So if we just connect these two boards with straight traces, uh, we short a bunch of stuff out, which is a problem. Luckily, the solution isn't too hard. I'll just need to give the traces on the interconnect boards a slight curve and order new boards. But when I discovered this problem, there just was not enough time left before the test flight. And also it seemed too risky to bet everything on the new design just working on the first try. So I needed a quick fix just for the test flight. My first approach was to try and scrape the unwanted pads off and boy oh boy did that not work. It was kind of funny because when ordering these interconnects I wanted to make sure that they would survive repeated mating cycles and so I went with hard gold plating. And the hard gold plating delivered as promised, there was absolutely no way I could scrape these pads off. It was both a bit annoying and also hilarious because I could not have come up with a better ad for hard gold plating from PCBWay if I tried. My next idea was to kind of lift the whole traces off and that worked much better. Unfortunately, I don't have a way yet to record video through my microscope and these 0.35mm wide traces are just much too small to capture with my macro lens in any detail. So to illustrate what I did to lift these traces off, I'll turn to a didactic tool as old as time. Breakfast. In this dramatic reenactment, the crispy strips of bacon are the copper traces and the sumptuous, only slightly sweetened pancake batter on top is the hard gold plating. The cutting board represents the FR4 substrate. Freshly brewed black coffee, some juice and the French croissant are just serving suggestions. So after the initial attempt to scrape the delicious hard gold plating off didn't go anywhere, I started probing at the edges of the traces with pointed tweezers. Now the thing is that the copper traces are quite crispy and brittle, so if you try to dig in at the very top, chances are that you slip or just break off the tip. On the other hand, if you dig in way down here, you'll break the trace in half. The ideal place I found to lift the trace up is laterally near the top. You will have to come in at a steep angle and dig down a bit, but as soon as you see the trace starting to lift, you can lever it up and the tip should come off intact. At this point, you can probably lift up the entire trace. Copper work hardens quite a bit, so don't hesitate and keep pulling and you will get the whole thing in one go. Yummy. On the actual PCB, it looked something like this. I ended up pulling off even more traces just to be sure that nothing would short out. So this was a very hacky fix and it also meant that comms between boards was out of the question for this flight. But I was kind of okay with this since I didn't have enough time to write anything beyond very basic flight software anyways. So for this flight, we only got power through Backbus. The Compute Module 5 carry board. There are a number of things on the CM5 carry board that are untested as of yet, like Ethernet, the M.2 slot and Canvas. So I will report on those once I have investigated them. One thing that really made my day when it comes to this carry board is that both camera serial interfaces worked on the first try. I know that's kind of setting the bar low, but ultimately what I cared most about for this test flight was just running the CM5 and capturing stills. The IMU shows up as an I2C device, but so far I have been unsuccessful talking to it. I suspect it may not like the active oscillator I paired it with. Unfortunately, I haven't broken out the oscillator selection pins there, so I'll just have to figure out how to debug this. The MCU carrier boards. With these I was just happy that both function board slots work and we can talk to the function boards over UART, SPI and I2C. It's kind of a fact about SparkFun Micromod that not every combination of processor board and function board just works out of the box, but this is a solid start to figuring out which ones can be made to work. So the UBlox M8 and GNSS function board at first only worked over UART until I realized that I had to specifically turn on NMEA messages via I2C 
using this uBlox uCenter software. And since I use Ubuntu, I had to run it in a bottle, which worked fine, but the font would render in this helpfully microscopic size. I'm not too familiar with configuring uBlox modules, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. But if you have any questions about this specific configuration process, please leave a comment. The Blue's wireless note card was the easiest to get working, thanks to their MicroPython example code. All you have to do is insert a SIM card and follow their setup guide, which will have you connect to the note card using that serial. From this, you will get a product ID, which you can plug into your MicroPython script and Bob's your uncle. There is a lot to explore with note card, which I didn't have time for, so I just used their basic built-in tracking. This locks its position when it's in motion and sends that to NoteHub. Apart from the function boards, there are a bunch of other features on the MCU carriers that still need to be tested and debugged, namely the current sensors, the IMU, CAN bus and FRAM. The real-time clock works, but I suspect there is something wrong with the backup battery circuit because it tends to lose its time. Overall, I think this is a decent first revision of the MCU carrier, well, apart from the fact that I just slightly messed up the spacing of the solder nuts, so I have to use washers to hold in the processor board. One thing I will change is the way the MCU carriers connect to a PC. I didn't want to have any extra components on the PCB, so I went with this very experimental approach and made a breakout board that would connect using these coplanar clips that are originally intended for LED strips. Surprisingly, USB works without a problem over these, but the whole thing is just a bit too flimsy and weird. So in the future I'll swap this out with a regular old USB-C connector. The reason I didn't go with that in the first place is that we not only need to supply 5V but also 33 volts to the MCU carrier when we're not powering it from the EPS. And I didn't want to have an extra LDO on each MCU carrier just for this. And I still don't want to have that, so maybe you guessed it, but I think it's time for a non-standard USB-C implementation, yay, which is always a good idea. Um, but that's a topic for a dedicated MCU Carrier Revision 2 video. The LoRa 3 byte bug. So the biggest and most annoying problem I encountered with the MCU Carrier boards is what I call the LoRa 3 byte bug. On MCU1 I have a SparkFun Micromod LoRa function board on which I have swapped out the 915MHz LoRa module with an 868MHz one. Side note here, if you want to use the UFL connector instead of the SMA one, you need to switch this 0402 resistor around. Now I can talk to this module using MicroPython, but no matter what I try, it will only transmit the first three bytes of a message and the rest is a garbled mess. This strongly smells like a decoding issue or something wrong with how I read the FIFO buffers, but even after spending multiple full days trying to get this to work, I did not get a centimeter closer to a solution. This is definitely something I'll want to do a deep dive into in the future, but I wasn't able to fix it in time for the first flight. But as they say, if life gives you 3 bytes, you make telemetry, so I decided to just transmit the altitude divided by 10 and compressed with Seabor, which actually gave me 4 usable bytes. This was the plan at least, but ultimately something else failed and LoRa didn't transmit at all. I am still trying to figure out what happened there, so if you are curious to find out, consider subscribing so you don't miss the next episode. One possible solution would be to not use MicroPython. C is probably a more adequate language for this, but since I don't know any C, I'm using MicroPython for now. Also, if you have a bunch of experience using LoRa with MicroPython, I could really use your help with this. The links to the flight and ground segment scripts are in the description. So I think this is all I wanted to mention regarding integrating SN1 for the test flight. The rest of the flight configuration remained exactly as discussed before. I had the DJI 04 Pro as backup video transmission, two spots as backup location trackers, one APRS transmitter for safety, a flashing LED, a tag with my name and number on it, and some sturdy nylon string to tie everything together. The only thing that changed shortly before the flight was the parachute. I was a bit over 2 kilograms with this configuration, so I got a 54 inch ultralight parachute from randomengineering.co.uk. This parachute only weighs 57 grams and brought the total weight down to 1990 grams, which made me unreasonably happy. So as you saw, there is a lot to improve all over the place, but there are also a few things that work quite nicely. Overall, given the fact that we are at just over a year and a half of development time after starting with a blank sheet, I'm pretty happy with how things are going. In the next episode, we are going to talk about the test flight and have a look at some of the data we got back. In the meantime, I would love to welcome you on our brand new Discord server. Again, check the description for the invite link. I would like to thank PCBWay for being a great supporter of this project and just super nice to work with. And thank you very much for watching all the way through. 
Let me know if you liked this episode and I'll see you in the next one.